The Adventures of Frank Race, starring Paul Dubov with Tony Barrett as Mark Donovan. The war changed many things, the face of the earth and the people on it. Before the war, Frank Race worked as an attorney, but he traded his law books for the cloak and dagger of the OSS. And when it was over, his former life was over too. Adventure had become his business. The Adventures of Frank Race. And now we join Frank Race for The Adventure of the Gold Worshipper. The Western and Orient Insurance Company has been in existence nearly a hundred years. Formed in San Francisco to insure gold shipments, it has since underwritten everything from wind jammers to coming out parties. It writes unusual policies and deals with unusual people. So as I entered the home offices on Market Street, I was prepared for an unusual assignment, and I got it. From the lips of Gaylord Stewart, President and General Manager. Know anything about Macau race? It's no feather bed. One of the toughest spots in the Far East right now. If you've been in Macau, you've no doubt heard of Armando Dutra. Yes, one of the biggest gold brokers in Asia. He asked me to send him the finest investigator I knew. So I called you. Thanks for the confidence. You'll find you can practically write your own ticket on the fee. But don't get the idea that I'm handing you something on a platter. Now, Dutra's daughter has been abducted. She's his only child, and he'll do anything to get her back. But in that country, you have some idea as to what you're up against. Frankly, I think you'll be walking into one of the toughest assignments you've ever taken on. Macau on the south coast of China. Blue skies and a benevolent sun. The last time I'd been there, I'd know nothing but rain. This was quite a change. And I found it hard to retain the feeling that I'd come to participate in violence. Here was a colony about which the poets had sung, and I was ready to believe the lyrics. Then, less than an hour after Mark Donovan and I had checked in at the Bella Vista Hotel, there came a knocking at our door. Visitors already? I'll get it, Mark. Race! Race! I'm all right, Mark. You sure? I've opened doors like that before. Yeah. But you twisted just in time on that one. Look at your coat, will you? Powder points. It'll go on the expense account. Look, what's a pitch on this? We've only been in town a couple of hours. Could have been a door-to-door salesman who didn't care for my expression. No, no, wait a minute. I'm for real. Nobody knows us here. Mark, when you move into a thing like this, you're usually pretty well tagged. And by all the wrong people. I went out into a city that had altered its mood. Once again, it had become the place I'd known before a harbor of danger of Chinese junks and the gold trade. And I was there for a date with the highest priest of that trade, Armando Dutra. Seeing him for the first time made me think of chilled champagne. Strange sort of man. Insisted on showing me through his gold processing plants before we talked about anything else. We buy gold from the rest of the world, Reis. The price of $35 an ounce. Then we sell it for $50 to the frightened men of China who seem to think that gold is their only security. It comes to us in the shape of these heavy bars. We then reduce it to these thin sticks you see here. There is an additional profit in that. Our buyers do not require as rich a gold as we import. Our business is legal and profitable. Naturally, there are thousands of the unscrupulous who try to prey upon those of us who receive its benefits. No, some of them have found a way to take my daughter. You heard nothing about her? I received a demand for money. 5,000 American dollars. I paid it, but my daughter has not been returned. Where was the money delivered? To a dockside tavern kept by a Scotsman who once served with the British Army. Was the tavern watched? Oh, yes. I was instructed to hide the money in one of the rooms of the place. I was warned against any attempt at spying, but... Discreetly, from...
from a distance. I had the building watched. Any result? We noticed a man who dropped in at the tavern several times. We noticed him because he was well-dressed, because he carried one arm in a sling. Naturally, I could not afford to have him picked up. Could I see a photograph of your daughter? Unfortunately, no. She has not had her photograph taken for several years. I forbade it because I was afraid of just what has happened. Abduction. She has dark hair, blue eyes. Her mother was a Russian. Mm -hmm. She is quite beautiful. But I realized that this might describe a hundred other women in our area. I'm afraid so. I think it only fair to tell you, Race. You will not be working alone in this. I have been able to call in Eric Decker, a European detective. Also Major Carstairs, Hong Kong police. Carstairs is here now. I shall have him come in. Dutra rang a bell. A servant appeared for a few terse instructions. And a few minutes later, I met Major Alan Carstairs. I've heard of you, Race. Glad you're in on this affair. It looks a bit uh, sticky. Dutra has been telling about this fellow with the bandaged arm. And from what I can gather, he might be an Englishman, a Frenchman, or any Caucasian. Going to be like looking for the proverbial needle. Well, personally, I'd like to start in with that tavern. Does it have a name? It's called the Scarab. And one word of advice, Race. When you go there, don't go alone. <laughs> the Scarab. And one look at it gave plenty of reasons for what Carstairs had said. It wasn't hard to spot the proprietor. He stood behind the bar beneath a blown-up picture of himself in kilty uniform. Holy cow, what a layout. I would feel safer in a coffin. Listen, Ray, look, if we start anything here, let's do it back to back. Huh? Move around, see what you can find out. I'll talk to the owner. All right. <laughs> what do you have, lad? Scotch and soda. Oh, a yank, eh? Well, that means I better make it a double. No? A double, yes. Yeah, you're a stranger around here. Yes, I'm called Frank Race. Uh, I'm Dalglish, which is too much for most of these people, so... So they call you Scotty. Hey. That's a good likeness of you up there, the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. Yeah, you knew her, Tartan. Eh? I know where you were, too. Dunkirk, Ella Lemay, Normandy. Uh, wait a minute. I'll have a drink with you. And yours is on the house. Hey, <laughs> uh, 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 it's good to meet a lad like you. That goes double, Scotty. And may I say you have a sharp eye for strangers. <laughs> in this business, you need it. Then possibly you remember a man you had in here a few days ago. A man with his arm in a sling. Eh? It's possible that I do remember such a man. But uh, intending no hurt to your feelings, having a quick eye for a stranger and being willing to gossip about him are two different things. So they are, Scotty, so they are. I understand. Good. Here, fling this down your hatch. And it's on the house, too. He was friendly about it, and there was nothing to do but answer his grin with a shrug. But if one man won't talk, there are always others who will. As I finished the second drink, I felt a pull at my sleeve. The act of a little man standing next to me, an emaciated little man with a face like a dose of quinine. I am king. If you would know about this person you seek... He waited for my nod, then led me to a table at the far end of the room. This man with the broken arm, it is important that you find him? Shall we say, quite important. Important enough to be worth a hundred American dollars? Provided I see my man. You would perhaps be willing to tear the bills in two and give me half an account? That's agreeable. Here. All right. Now where do I find him? In Little Yellow House, at the foot of Royal Street. Come, I will show you. He started to get up, but a hand on his shoulder jammed him down again. There were two of them standing over us. And Cheng had taken on the look of a hen that's just been thrown into a poultry scale. You didn't think you'd get away with this, did you, Stooley? Get, get away with what? You know what happens to guys who squeal, don't you? I, I don't know what you mean. It's simple, pal. I just mean it. <laughs> Cheng twisted, a look of horror on his face as he stared at the knife, a knife that stuck from his chest. He toppled against me, saving my life because the other thug had lunged with the second blade. Get this other guy through! A blade that drove another gash into Cheng's dying body. I twisted under him, went beneath the table, clutched a pair of legs, and yanked! Ah! Then 
and I was in the middle of a seething mass. Blasters, Chinese, Europeans, it was everybody's fight. I twisted and punched my way toward the door. I got to within ten feet of it with one eye shut and an arm numb. Hey, Chris, what's that? I'm going to reach. Hey, hit him in the button just that way, but he'd have shot you, Ace. Hey, Scotty, he certainly would have. Hey, here comes for him, Race. Wait a minute, I'll okay. take this one. <laughs> and this one is from me. Come on, get out of here, the pair of I'll be back to settle with you, Scotty. I'll be back. It wasn't hard to find the little yellow house at the foot of Royal Street. One of those high, stooped, semi-basement affairs. It looked more like something you'd find in New England than in an Asiatic seaport. Mark rang an old-fashioned pull bell several times, with no result. So we did a little breaking and entering, had a look around. It was neat, well-furnished, with evidence that a woman had been living there. We gave it up for the time being and went back to the Bella Vista Hotel. Mark went up to the room and I headed for the bar. It was a long bar, but no bartender in sight. I was just about to call it off when a provocative voice brushed against my ear. I understand that you are looking for a man who has a broken arm. She smelled like a garden in the evening, looked like your favorite dream, and presented a gaze that said, make a pass at me and you'll draw nothing but a right cross. But for such a blonde, I take that kind of a punch any time. So I reached for the glass she was holding. You may not like that. It's a Gibson. I like it. Because, believe me, I need it. Why uh, do you want to see the man with his arm in the sling? I... I write for the newspapers. He's news. Why is he news? Seems to be wrapped up in a grand-scale kidnapping. I could use a scoop on it. How could one be sure that you are a newspaper man? Look, baby, even from one eye, you're a thoroughly beautiful wench with the doggiest legs I've seen since an aerialist I glimpsed in Paris last month. But if I remember correctly, I did not seek you out. Quite true. It was I who made the approach. Then let's dispense with the police state attitude. You want something of me. What is it? If I took you to that man for this scoop, would you be willing to help him? In what way? He's been hurt. He needs help. But help, that is, shall we say... Of the proper kind? Yes. All right, let's go. In the cab, she identified herself as Afton Gage from New Orleans. It sounded sincere. I couldn't feel too sure it wasn't genuine. She wouldn't say anything else about herself, and we finally arrived at the little yellow house on Royal Street. I told the cabbie to wait, and we went up to the door. It's pretty dark. You sure we'll find him here? It is a very old house. I'll have to light the incandescent mantle. There. You know, even in this light, you're beautiful. Where now? Down these stairs. To the basement? Hmm. Baby, it's dark down there. Would you like me to lead the way, Race? Touche. We go below. Race. Wait. What is it? I thought I... Look! The ceiling! I don't see a thing. Don't see how you can either. Not with... <laughs> Something going around my neck from behind. A thong. A thong being twisted by her hands. I was being garroted. I tried to kick back, but her shins were too high. I was going unless... With a last effort, I threw myself forward. <laughs> Return to the adventures of Frank Race in just about one minute. And now back to the adventures of Frank Race. came out of it conscious of nothing but darkness and a shoulder that had gone on strike and was picketing the rest of me painfully. I fumbled for a match, found one, and managed to locate the gas jet. As I lit it, I heard the girl stir. 
She lay half on her side with her blonde head resting on some sort of carton. I got down on my knees beside her and had a good look. Her face hadn't been hurt. Her head seemed to be all right. Even in the gaslight, she looked gorgeous. Here was a female who had tried to murder me, and in a manner no one likes to be murdered. But with her face that close to me, I, I couldn't hold out. I bent over and pressed my lips to hers. Softly at first, then hard. Coming out of it, baby. What, what happened to us? Nothing much. You tried to throttle me. We pitched down the stairs. I must have been the buffer. You seem to be all in one piece. I, I think I'm all right. You want to try getting up? Grace, you, you kissed me after what I did to you. Why? You're very lovely. Is that all it takes? Being lovely? Who knows? Least of all the man who does it. But I'm no problem to myself. You're the question mark. After all, I was only trying to help you. So you make an effort to murder me. Trying to help me? I've been trying to find you to return you to your father. I don't know what you mean. Let's drop the act, baby. That hair of yours, it's lovely, but the tint is natural. I had a look just now. The roots are quite dark. All right. So I am Stephanie Dutra. But I want to be let alone. Which means there's a man in the picture. Yes. There is a man. I'm in love with him. But with my father, such dreams are impossible. So the two of you pull this abduction hoax. Have you married him yet? Not yet. There have been difficulties. How old are you, Stephanie? <sighs> That's always a futile question, Ray. In her own mind, a woman is always too young or too old. Never of an age to reveal. My guess would be about 19. Well, you, you are entitled to your judgment. I'm going to have to take you home, baby. I suppose so. But first, with the arm that still worked, I drew her slowly to her feet, slipped the arm around her and kissed her again. For a second, I got no reaction at all. And suddenly a pulse seemed to throb through her body. And for just an instant, I felt sure she returned the caress. Grace, what, what are you trying to prove? Just a little therapy, honey. If it works, she might be a lot happier. Come along. It is your intention to return me to my father. Let's get it over. <laughs> In the cab, we rolled through narrow streets, labored up winding ramps, the girl at my side sitting in bleak silence. I didn't feel too talkative myself. I'd broken the case, but for some reason, there wasn't much gaiety in the thoughts. Race? Yes? I do not think you are going to take me to my father after all. No? And what? Mm. Oh, I see. We're being tailed. And, uh... It looks as though this is about as far as we go. They pop from that car like slices from a Toastmaster, four of them, including the two knife wielders of the Scotsman's Tavern. Move over, Dar, while I plug that guy. No, you will leave him alone. I insist on it. Okay, but if he makes one phony move... Race. Goodbye, Race. So long, Stephanie. Lots of luck. Thank you, Race. I don't know whether you noticed it or not, chum, but I'm still here. I noticed it. <laughs> the girl didn't. Now she's gone, I'm going to take care of you right. Right between the... Between the eyes. Never write off a man with a hand in his pocket, chum. But then you've had that coming for a long time, haven't you? It evens up for what you did to that Chinese. <laughs> Hey, 
In the lobby of the Bella Vista Hotel, I ran into Major Alan Carstairs, and he shook my hand. Well, Race, I trust you've had more luck on this case than I've encountered. The luck I've had has been mostly bad. I found the girl all right, then I lost her again. There's nothing simple about the affair. She doesn't want to go back to her father. Oh, one of those things, eh? Well, that means we've really got our work cut out for us. Race, Race, I've been looking all over. Hello, Mark. Hello. Sounds as though you've been hurrying. Oh, you're not kidding. And I got a load of info for you, brother. Something I'm... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mark. This is Major Carstairs, Mark Donovan. How did you... Oh, hi, Major. Uh, uh, Ray. <laughs> it's all right, Mark. The Major is in on this with us. Oh, oh. What's the information? Well, give me my breath. Huh? Something kind of peculiar. See? Yes? Look, I'm kicking around a waterfront, wondering what you might be doing, see? When I happened to take a gander at a boat... Man, not a big boat. One of them jobs that they call a, a, a la- launch. 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 launch, launch yes. Yeah, launch. launch. And uh, there's three things about it that make it interesting. Now, first, it was lying very low in the water, see? Second, the engine seemed to be conked out with three guys working on it. And, brother, when I say working, I mean frantically. Tell the yeah. story, Mark, yeah, will yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. And third, one of these jokers is wearing his arm in a sling. Now, this kind of makes me curious, and they all had their heads buried in the hatch up forward, see? So I sneak in for a look at what might be in the cabin, see? I will now give you three guesses. One is enough. Gold. Mm, you killed you, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gold. Big gold bars. Maybe a couple of feet long. A whole mess of them. I used to wear it. Come right over here. It wouldn't hurt to take a look at that, Carstairs. I believe we're safe enough in having a look. There's probably no significance to the gold. It's perfectly legal to buy and take it out of Macau. It's only when it reaches other ports that it becomes contraband. But the chap with his arm in a sling, we're certainly interested in him. Will you lead us to it, Donovan? Hold it. There she is. Look, and they're still working on the engine. They're trying to start it. We still have time to stop them. Come on. Hey, hey, they're pushing it away from the dock. Hold it. We want to come aboard. They don't look as though they're going to... Race, race, duck! Move back, race! Well, look, chum, we ain't got a chance against that chatterbox. He's quite right. We'd better clear out of here. Well... What do you think? I think I'm licked, Mark. I'm not even sure I know what it's all about. I just think a beautiful girl is making some kind of a mistake. But I'm not even sure about that. You mean a Dutra dame? What kind of mistake? She's in love with some fellow who seems to be a first-class heel. I I say that, and I don't even know his identity. The way he's involving her in all this grief, I, I don't know. As I said before, I'm up a tree. Well, you must admit it's exciting anyway. Kidnappings, guys blazing away with Tommy guns, long, thick bars of gold. Ooh, that gold, that gold, brother. <laughs> Would I like to glom onto one of those items? Nothing seems related. Here we get in a fuss over some gold bars on a motorboat, and it does... Wait a minute, Mark. Gold bars? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? Nothing, really. Nothing but a hunch, but I might as well play it. Come on. <laughs> Tell you, race, it's cruelty to animals. This animal, me, me. You run me around town for three hours. We've been hiding in this doorway for another couple hours. I'm getting hungry. Something will break, Mark. It's got to. Yeah, and it's probably going to be my... Hold it, Someone's coming. <gasps> Take it gently, baby. We've met before. Oh, race. Yes, race. Knock on the door, Mark. Yeah, sure. Come in, honey. I thought... Hello, Carstairs. Or whatever your name is. What are you doing here? Carstairs. What does he mean, Johnny? I, uh, I don't know, honey. Let's step inside, baby. Close the door, Mark. What did you call him, Stephanie? Johnny? Johnny what? His name is Anders. Johnny Anders. He's been calling himself Major Carstairs of the Hong Kong Police Force. He's been working for your father trying to solve the mystery of your abduction. Tell me something, baby. What do you know about a motorboat called the Lotus? Does it belong to Johnny? Yes, but I... You don't have to tell him any more, Stephanie. No, she doesn't need to. It's been a bad deal, baby. This man's been taking you for what we call a ride. He got information from you, didn't he? About the workings of your father's gold processing plant, about the people who worked there. He needed that information so he could steal about a million dollars in gold. You were only part of the loot, Stephanie, believe me. He's weaving quite a fairy tale, honey. Come on, let's get out of here. No, Johnny. I don't think I want to go. Oh, just like that? 
A few words from this guy and you throw everything out the window. I think I changed my mind before this, Johnny. It's just that now I'm sure of it. Well, that's a shame, honey. Because I can't leave you here, can I? Hold it, Reese! This gun spits lead faster than you can think. I'm sorry I have to do this, but it... Hey, Reese. What tipped you off? I've always thought my pip-pip accent was very good. It wasn't the accent, Johnny. It was that gold. If you'd really been Major Carstairs of the Hong Kong Police Force, you'd have known that gold never leaves Macau in long, chunky bars. It comes in that way, but they reduce it to small sticks for export. Well, a man can know everything, can he? But then it doesn't always pay. Take you, Race. You're going to cash in your chips because you knew too much. As of now... <laughs> Thanks, Mark. I'd almost forgotten you were here. <laughs> ah, don't never do that, Race. Well, this fellow made that mistake, and <laughs> look what happened to him. Frank Ray, starring Paul Dubov with Tony Barrett as Mark Donovan, comes to you from Hollywood. Others heard in tonight's cast were Michael Ann Barrett, Jack Crucian, Clark Gordon, Gunnar Peterson, and Wilms Herbert. This series is written and directed by Buckley Angel and Joel Murcott. The music is composed and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again this time next week for another dramatic chapter in The Adventures of Frank Race. Art Gilmore speaking. This is a Bruce Ells production. Join the Timeless Classics on Golden Age Radio. If you're loving the nostalgia and captivating stories, consider supporting our channel with a tip. Your generosity helps us continue bringing you the best of vintage radio entertainment. Simply click on the link in the description. Thank you for being part of our community. Lost in Brazil invites you on an unforgettable journey where every moment is an adventure waiting to be discovered. Join us as we uncover the soul of Brazil, one incredible experience at a time. Click on the link in the description and embark on the ultimate Brazilian odyssey. You have been listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R, brought to you by G3PL.com. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Old Time Radio Research Group for their remarkable efforts in preserving and archiving the captivating world of old time radio programs. Their dedication to safeguarding these precious audio gems ensures that future generations can relish the enchanting stories, music, and entertainment of the past. Their invaluable contribution allows us to step back in time and experience the magic of radio history firsthand. Their link is in the description below.